Let's stand together for the reading of God's Word. Open your Bibles to the book Genesis. Find chapters 10 and 11. We won't read both those chapters now as a reading of God's Word. But that would be a little while, wouldn't it? Uh, so we'll, what we'll do is I'm going to read a couple of verses that uh, come from Psalm, uh, the Psalms and then one from the Proverbs that establish the main idea that I want you to take from the story of Nimrod uh, into your hearts and into your lives as you proceed from this place to go into the harvest field and serve the Lord this week. And one of them is Psalm number 118, verse 9. Of course, you're welcome to join me there if you'd like to read along with me. Psalm 118 and verse 9. And the Bible says this, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. It's a very important biblical principle. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Princes, in our way of looking at that word, would be rulers. I don't know, governors, mayors, presidents, uh, legislators, and so on. Better to put our trust in the Lord than to put our trust in princes. And then Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. In chapter 3, verse 5, the Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not in unto thine own understanding. And all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Those verses are ones I'd like you to keep in mind as we proceed into the message this morning. Let's pray. Father, help me to preach in these now to hear. And as we pray at the beginning of the service, we want to hear a word from the Lord today. Uh, I desire that every single person in this room will hear from you in a direct and personal way. Lord, you know the need represented in every heart in this room. You know the questions. You know the issues that they deal with and struggle with. I do not. But I pray, Father, that you will, by the miracle, Lord, of the Holy Spirit, ministering your grace through wholesome words to needy hearts, work the work that needs to be done today, that everyone here might go home knowing that we've met with you this morning. In Jesus' name, I'm asking you for that. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, Genesis chapters 10 and 11 is the passage we're going to be covering this morning. God remembered Noah. And when God remembered Noah, the Bible says his wrath assuaged. He sent a wind over the earth and the waters assuaged and abated as his wrath also assuaged and abated. Genesis chapter 8, verses 1 to 3. In one year's time, the floodwaters washed away all flesh from the earth, with the exception, of course, of Noah, his family, and the beasts that were with him in the ark. When the waters had ebbed back into the seas and back into the fountains of the deep from which they sprang, God commanded the eight souls saved from the flood, that's Noah, his wife, his three children, and their wives, together with the creatures that were there with them on the ark, to disembark. And man was given a second chance on the earth. And Noah's first official act was to prepare an altar and worship God. Well, that's a good beginning. It didn't last very long. But God smelled the sweet savor of Noah's offering and his heart was stirred. The Bible says, quote, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. Now listen, this is key. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing or everything living as I have done. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. Later, God clarifies, he is saying he will never again destroy man from off the earth by a flood. We know that he will destroy the earth by fire at another time. A new world is set before Noah and his family. A new opportunity, a fresh new start. And a new world required a new divine order. God orders his economy, if you will. He orders his house. He orders his affairs with man differently in what we call different dispensations. 
the way he organized his relationship with man in his covenant with Adam was in some ways different from the way he organized his relationship with man in his covenant with Noah. You can look at Genesis chapter 9, verse 1, and you'll see that he told Noah to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And if you look back at the covenant God made with, or the command that God gave to Adam in Genesis 1, verse 28, you'll see the same thing. You'll find in the, what we call the Noahic covenant, God's arrangement with mankind after the flood, that God had given to man every green thing to eat, and every herb, and so on. You'll see that in Genesis 9, verse 3, and in Genesis chapter 1, 29. Likewise, God told Adam, every green thing is for you, for meat, and every herb, and so on. God gave to man dominion over all the creatures of the earth. In fact, over all the resources of the earth. And that's called the dominion. God gave the dominion to Adam. And here, God, again, puts all the earth and all of its resources under the hand of man in his agreement with Noah. You can see that when you compare Genesis 9-2 with Genesis 1 verse 28. But beyond those things, there are some changes that are introduced now. Some things are different now from the way they used to be. Here's one of the things that's different. Now all the creatures of the earth would fear man. How sad. All the creatures of the earth would fear man. And all the creatures of the earth would be food for man. It wasn't that way before. But after the flood, now, all the creatures of the earth would be food for man. And all the creatures of the earth would fear man. Now that's the ordination of God. If someone says, well, I want to go back to the days of Adam, you can't get there. In fact, that would be rather Nimrod-like of you, and I'll explain that some more as we move along. Here are some things that are different. One, all the creatures would fear man, and all the creatures would be food for man, and this. Remember when Cain killed his brother Abel, God did not allow capital punishment. Cain was afraid. Everywhere I go, someone's going to want to kill me. That's what sin does, you know. When you sin, it makes you fearful. And you're looking over your shoulder. You know, the Bible says the, the wicked fear when no man pursues. Or the wicked flee when no man's pursuing. And that was Cain. His conscience was bothering him. And he was afraid he was going to get killed the way he killed his brother. But God put a mark on Cain and said, Nobody can touch Cain. He's under my protection. God did not allow the death penalty before the flood. <clears throat> but now, God established the death penalty. If a man takes the blood of another man, then by man will that man's blood be taken. And that's in Genesis 9, 3 to 5. In verse number 6 particularly. I hesitate to take the time it would require to explain that when it says, by man his life will be taken, means not that the individual has the power to act in capital punishment, but that man, organized together, can act in capital punishment. But that'll have to be a message for another time. I don't have time to go into it. Every creature would be terrified every time they saw a rain cloud gather. Don't you suppose? You imagine the devastation of that flood and coming off the flood and it's seen a nice, bright, sunny day, and then all of a sudden you see a cloud forming in the sky that looked dark and ominous. It'd probably scare you. Probably running for cover and get nervous, don't you suppose? Of course. Especially if rain started falling out of the sky again. Probably panic and head for the highest point you could find. You'd look for a high place in a hurry, fearful that, oh no, here comes the flood again. And so God went out of his way to assure man that will not happen again. God provided assurance that he would restrain the rains and the seas and strengthen the fountains of the deep and preserve man from the fear of 
a flood that would cover the whole earth. He didn't promise there would never be a flood here or there. But he promised there would never be a flood over the whole earth that would destroy all mankind. In order to give man this assurance, God put a rainbow in the cloud. He said, I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. Interesting that this covenant, the way God framed it, was an agreement between him and the earth. In other words, God was concerned about the little critters that might get afraid when the rains, when the rains come. He is like that, you know. He pays attention to the sparrows that fall. Keeps, a, keeps track of every number of the hairs in your head. I mean, he's very interested in the details of things. And he was concerned that his lions and tigers and bears would get afraid when the rains began to fall. But of course he was also, well, he was concerned about us too, don't you, don't you suppose? All right, now this is important to the story, so follow along. Thus ends the story of Noah <coughs> and begins the story of Abram, who is known by us as Abraham. I'm going to explain why I include chapters 10 and 11 under the section of my notes, the Chronicles of Abraham. Noah lived 350 years after the flood. In Genesis 9, 28 through 29. And that means that he died in about 1998 B.C., before Christ. If you get my notes, and if you'll get a companion study guide, biblical chronology. In fact, I'm thinking about making that available free to all of you who have registered for this course because I think it's a real useful study guide. And in fact, I believe we'll do that. And so I'll, I'll let you know about that. If you've registered for this series of lessons, then I'll make sure you get my book, Biblical Chronology, because it does all this work of laying out how we come up with these dates and everything, all right? So Noah lived 350 years after the flood, which means he died in 1998 B.C., and Abram was born, you read about that in Genesis 11:27 to 32, about two years after Noah passed away. So basically, the story of Noah is preface to the history of Abraham. Chapters 10 and 11 are about, or provide a bridge, if you will, from the flood to Abraham. And it sets up the point of God's call upon Abraham, as you'll see when we proceed. Abram's story begins right here. It begins with the story of Nimrod, which might seem a little strange to you right now, but you'll get it as we proceed. Abram, for example, was called out of Ur of the Chaldees. Well, guess what? Ur of the Chaldees is a reference to that area that the Bible refers to as ancient Babylon. And who was the founder of Babylon? Nimrod. Nimrod was the founder of the city, or the region there, that empire, that first empire, out of which Abraham was called. And he was called to be the progenitor of many nations. Well, this whole idea of nations started with Nimrod and the Tower of Babel when God intervened and scattered the people and divided them by their languages and they spread out across the earth, establishing the many nations. So you see how the story of Nimrod leads us into and prepares us for and sets the stage for the story of Abraham. From Abraham would come Shiloh, would come that king who would rule the whole earth. Well, the very first time any man called himself a, uh, called himself a king was Nimrod. He was the first one to do that. From Abraham would come the kingdom of God on the earth. And the first man to set up a kingdom of men on the earth was Nimrod. So you see how Nimrod is the beginning of Abraham's story. From Abraham would come the seed by whom all nations of the earth would be blessed. The deliverer who was promised to Adam and Eve. But after the flood, the world was one people with one language. So where did all the nations come from? How did the kingdoms come to a rise in the earth? And how is it that we've come to this long history of warfare between the kingdoms that all began with 
Nimrod. Thus the Chronicles of Abraham begin with the story of Nimrod. Founder of Babylon, the city of of Abram's nativity. The first man to hold the title of king in the earth. The beginning of the nations and of the kingdoms of men in open defiance against God. Now, the pattern I've established for this series of messages is I set up the message as I've just done and then pause to answer various questions. Well, I'm going to try to abbreviate that section a little more even than I did last time. And I'm going to refer you to your notes to get more detail. And those of you who have received your notes might say, well, that's great, but I looked at them this morning and there's no detail on those questions. Do you think I don't know that? I know. We'll get to it. <laughs> I find myself slipping farther behind in my expectations on this, but we will get it done. Just give me time to catch up. Uh, things come up in the week, and what can I say? you got to pastor the church. Amen? All right. So, uh, But three questions that I will be addressing in the notes more fully. There is no mention in the biblical account that the tower was destroyed by God. Odd, isn't it? How many of you thought the Bible says God destroyed the tower? Don't be afraid. I did too. All right. The Bible doesn't say God destroyed the tower. That's interesting. We assume that he did. But I think it's actually more interesting that it doesn't say he destroyed the tower. It does say they left off building the city. And we can assume they left off building the tower. Curious. God came and interrupted them in the midst of building the tower. It was never completed. And man has been trying to complete that tower ever since. As we shall see. Did the Nimrodians, I made that up, Nimrodians, but isn't it a cool word? Did the Nimrodians actually believe they were going to build a tower into heaven? What kind of nutcases are these people? That they actually think they were going to build a... Some people say that Nimrod planned to build a tower all the way to heaven. And then he was going to send his army up there. And he was going to charge heaven and try to overtake God. And I think the analogy suggested by that idea is probably pretty accurate. As we'll see. But I don't believe it's necessarily the case that Nimrod had that in mind. I think he had something else in mind. And it comes out in the course of the message. So I'll bring it out then. (coughs) And then finally, most consider the story of Nimrod to be a myth that's intended to explain how it came to pass that men are divided by their languages and scattered all over the earth. Uh, So how do we know that the story of Nimrod and the Tower of Babel is historical? Well, I go into that in some length in my notes, or I will, when I finish out that particular portion of these notes. Suffice it here to say, God said it happened this way, and I'm a whole lot more inclined to believe God than I am, well, just about anybody else. So I accept the story as, as true. Anybody have a problem with that? You probably wouldn't be at, a, at the Lighthouse Baptist Church if you did, more than likely. Or if you do, sadly, you probably won't be around very long. I'm sorry to hear that. I would rather keep you. But anyway, 70 years after Noah and his family departed from the ark, his son, Ham, you know, Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, And most of you believe it was Shem, Ham, and Japheth in that order. Am I right? No, actually, Japheth was the elder. Japheth was the firstborn. Ham was the secondborn. Shem was actually the third son of Noah. That's why you come to church. Because you learn all these really neat things that you didn't catch when you were reading through the scriptures and so on. So 70 years after Noah and his family departed from the ark, his son Ham had a grandson from his firstborn, Cush. Hope you can follow this. You almost need a chart or genealogical tree to kind of keep up, but you get the idea. And his name was Nimrod. Genesis 10, 6 to 8. Up to this time, Nimrod is the only descendant of Noah who is a descendant of note, somebody that was given particular attention by God in the scriptures. Noah gave birth to a man named Ham, who gave birth to a man he named Cush, who gave birth to a man he named Nimrod. And Nimrod is known throughout the world today. 
probably not a lot of people know about Cush. If you said Cush to some stranger, you might know. But I'll bet most people, even lost people, know the name Nimrod. Very, very famous man. And he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. That's what the Bible says. And Cush begot Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. I mean, this man had such an impact on history, his name reverberated or echoes all the way down till today. And he was a legend in his own time. And in his days it was said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Nimrod was born about 72 years after the flood. And he was not much more than 30 years old when he led the people of God to rebel against God. God instructed Noah in the covenant of the new world. And we mentioned that covenant in the beginning of our message. Certainly, Noah passed this on to his own children <coughs> and then they to their children. Or You know, Noah was around all the way up until two years before Abraham was born. So he, he lived, he was alive when all these children were being born that are named in Genesis chapters 10 and 11. Until you come to Abraham at the very end of chapter 11. So people had resource to a kind of uh, first source on the stories of the flood and so on. And of course, even their own, his own grandfather would have been able to tell him firsthand stories about the flood and so on. But Nimrod rebelled against God. God said he wanted the people to scatter over all the earth and replenish it. But Nimrod called upon the people to stay together. He wanted them to build a city. And he wanted them to build a tower that would reach unto heaven. And we can only speculate why so soon after the flood, men would have turned their back on God already and follow this rebellious young man. You know, at 30 years old, you might not think he's so young, but by the standards then, he was a pup. I mean, they lived to be 500 years old back then. 300 and so on. And, and then the generation after the, uh, fl after the flood began, the, the lifespan began shortening significantly. But we're still talking about 200, 300 years lifespan. So a 30-year-old man would be considered a very young man. And all the work we can do in chronology justifies the suggestion that Nimrod was probably in his 30s when he became the first world ruler to establish a kingdom in defiance of God. So let's talk about this. The king and his covenant. And by king here I mean God. Capital K King. God the king. <coughs> you read through the Psalms and you'll see it repeated over and again that God is our king. The Lord, he is king. God never intended any human being to be a king over men. God intended that he would be the king. This whole idea of a man presuming himself to be king and ruler over men is offensive to God. So let's talk about the king. And when I say the king here, I mean God and his covenant with man. God established his covenant with Noah. We already mentioned this covenant. We don't need to go back over it. I want to, however, bring out something. When Nimrod rebelled against God, he established something new on the earth. He established the idea that a man could rule another man. He established the idea that a man could take the place of God in the lives of men. He established this notion that there could be a king that stands between the king of kings and mankind. And so, that's a pretty serious failing, a pretty serious error, a very serious heresy, a doctrine that has created problems throughout human history with kingdom rising against kingdom, wars and rumors of wars. 
It, it comes out of this whole thing that Nimrod got started. But God gave man a promise, and he gave man a token of his good faith to keep that promise. See, what I want to do now is help you have some understanding of where Nimrod's coming from and what's going on here with this city and this tower. Remember that God understood that mankind would be afraid every time he saw a storm cloud gather, and certainly every time he felt a raindrop fall on his head. He probably would be filled with panic and run for the highest hill. And so God made a promise that man did not need to worry about that. You could, you could with confidence, go out across the earth, establish your homes, replenish the earth, spread out. Don't be afraid. I've given you a promise, and I put my bow in the cloud to assure you that when the storm clouds gather, I will look and see that bow, and I'll remember my promise not to allow the floods to rise and destroy the entire earth again. That, would serve, that should serve to comfort man in the days that storm clouds might gather and so on. But in this new world order, <laughs> where you have Nimrod, the mighty hunter uh, for the Lord, or before the Lord, this man that would lead the people out from under God, what was his thinking? What was he trying to do? God was king. All men were his subjects. God was the provider. God was the protector of man. But now a usurper king rises to power. So let's talk about this usurper king and his crime. You read about him in Genesis chapter 11, 1 to 9. And the interesting things about the genealogies in chapters 10 to 11 are considered in your notes. I touched on it a little bit in, in prayer time this morning earlier, but you can get into your notes and you, it will sort all that out for you. I'm going to skip all that right now and just go to the heart of the story here. Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, because Nimrod's negatives are so high and so strong, most Bible students will not allow him to have any favor from God at all in any way or at any time. <clears throat> and I believe that's a mistake. Because of their, their feeling that Nimrod's such a bad guy, that this verse that says Nimrod was a mighty hunter before the Lord, it must mean something bad. Sounds good. It sounds like he was favored. It sounds like he was renowned as a great hunter. And that this was a blessing that was recognized as coming upon him from God. Because he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. And so they come off with things like Nimrod was a mighty hunter of men. That Nimrod was a murderer. And a murderer of men. He might have been. But I, I always have trouble with with you know, using that kind of approach to interpret and understand Scripture. <laughs> I, much pref I feel a lot more comfortable leaving the language alone, letting it say what it says. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. You know what that means? He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Now, there was a prohibition against eating the blood with the flesh. I don't know, maybe Nimrod violated that but we're not told that he did. You see what I'm trying to say here? But be because it's assumed, Nimrod is just a really bad guy, and he was, that therefore this, this language, a mighty hunter before the Lord, that means he went and hunted men. Or, well, okay, if we can't get that one to fly, that means when he hunted, he ate the blood with what he killed. I don't know. I don't know that we can say any of those things. You know what could very well be this, that God favored Nimrod. How many times have you read in the Bible that God favored a man who later disappointed him? Every single time. I think it's perfectly reasonable to, if we're going to assume anything, to assume that the language means exactly what it says, nothing more, nothing less. That Nimrod was a mighty hunter. He was a great man. Obviously a very charismatic leader. Obviously a very powerful man with great prowess in this, in, in this area of hunting. Uh, he was on top of his game, as it were. I mean, nobody could hunt like Nimrod could hunt. And it gave him great renown among the people. 
estimates of the population were only about a hundred years since the flood. We've got three families propagating, and then they multiply and so on. But we're not anywhere near where we were before the flood. We might have been in as many as 750 million and as many as 4 billion going into the flood, remember. But coming out of the flood now, we're about 100 years after the flood. And so there might have been maybe a million or so. That's still quite a few people. And so Nimrod is not becoming a dominant ruler over billions, but he's a dominant ruler over hundreds of thousands it may be as many as a million and so on. The estimates go all over the place because we don't have a whole lot of Bible information to, to support uh, the various conclusions. But Nimrod came from a very spiritually dark family, that we know. The story of Ham and the curse upon Canaan given to us not long after Noah came off the ark. He planted a vineyard and he became intoxicated with the fruit of the vine and he lay drunk in his nakedness. The Bible says that Ham came and looked on his nakedness. And we presume that he mocked his father, but we don't know that for sure. <clears throat> what we do know is he went and got his brothers, Japheth and Shem. And they came and they had a different approach to this issue. They took a blanket, turned their face away from their father's nakedness and walked backwards and covered their father's nakedness. Whereas Ham looked on his father's nakedness. People miss this all the time, but when Noah cursed, set the curse upon Ham's family, he didn't direct it upon Ham. He directed it upon his fourth son, Canaan. Everybody thinks, oh, God cursed or that Noah cursed Ham. He didn't curse Ham. He put the curse upon his grandson. Why would he do that? Well, the Bible does say in Deuteronomy that God visits the iniquity of the father upon the third and fourth generation. And it does happen that Canaan is the fourth generation from Ham. That's interesting. And there's a biblical principle here at work that the uh, errors and the flaws and, and, and so on of, of the father often show up in the children. And many times... The sins of the father are not visited upon the father in his lifetime, but the visitation shows up in his children and sometimes even in his grandchildren. And that's just the way it is. That's just the nature of sin. That's not some act or judgment of God. That's just the way sin works. You understand what I'm saying? <clears throat> Let's let this jet get out of the way here. I hope you I don't have time to go preach that whole sermon, but I can uh, I assure you it isn't the case that God is saying, well, I don't like what Ham did. I'm going to hit his kid. That's not what's going on here. But I'll tell you what is going on here, and you better, we better all pay attention to this. The things we do in our homes, the things we do in our lives, they will have an impact upon our kids all the way to the fourth generation. Amen? We better watch it. Because sometimes you'll do something and the judgment won't fall on you. But it'll show up in your kids. And I believe that's what happened here. In any event, God put a curse in the family of Ham. Let's look at it that way for a moment. And it's possible that there was some resentment against Noah that developed in the heart of Ham and his descendants in his family. Now, Ham was already spiritually skewed toward darkness, wasn't he? He was already inclined to give himself over to certain dark areas of his own mind and heart so that he would, instead of looking at his father and turning his face away and saying, oh my goodness, dad. And then go and get his brothers and say, look, we got to cover dad. No, the Bible teaches us that Ham stood there and looked at him and, I don't know, mocked him, scorned him. I'm not sure what. We're not told. It was enough that he would look upon his father's nakedness. In Leviticus, the Bible makes it very clear that the children are not to see the nakedness of their parents. God doesn't want that. Now, Satan will always try to get 
you to do things God doesn't want you to do. He'll always do that. So you need to be careful. And these movies and the world, they don't understand this stuff. They're a bunch of Hamites. They don't understand. They don't have that natural sensitivity that some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. There's some of you who, who meet just intuitively, you know, you, 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 if your parents are showing some of the, you, you, I don't want to see that. It's natural, isn't it? It's an instinctive thing. You've got the instinct of Shem. You have the instinct of Japheth. But if you're the type that would look at that and go, ha, 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 you have the instinct of Ham. Well, let me tell you something. God judges that instinct. And so we need to be careful that we listen to the law of God and we do not expose, the parents do not expose their nakedness to their children. Now, I, you know, I take things uh, a little ways here, but I don't know that I'm completely wrong about it. Shall I, I preach that sermon? No, you don't want to. Okay, I'll preach. Never mind. I was going to tell you about my household rules. I don't think my son has ever even seen my chest bear. Ever. I don't even show my ankles. I'm just kidding. I'm going too far now. I'm just playing around. Just playing around. Just playing around. All right. But Nimrod broke out from under God and he made himself a king. That is, he made himself the king. And he established the first kingdom of men on the earth out from under God. He defied God's covenant. And maybe a lot of this came out of the fact that he was alienated from the godly influence that was available to him in his grandfather, his great-grandfather Noah, because of this darkness in the heart of Ham. And maybe Ham, hearing the curse of God come upon his grandson, became bitter instead of better. But I can tell you something about God. When God does put a judgment on you, God always, he's always ready to show mercy in that judgment. Always. And if Ham had repented and humbled himself, he could have protected his son, Canaan. But he didn't do it. He became bitter, perhaps. I think we can assume that. Because the long history the Bible gives us of the family of Ham is one of spiritual darkness. How sad. It's so sad. But God has made great, great provision of grace upon the children of Ham. Did you know that? Oh, you go to the prophets. There, there are some places in, in the prophet Isaiah where God elevates the people of Ham in, in terms of his love and his concern for them to, the, to be equal to his love for Israel. Yeah. Over and again. It's an amazing thing. We'll have to get into that sometime. It's, but it's, it's right there in the, in the prophet Isaiah. But God promised he would not overflow the world with a flood. He promised he wouldn't do it. And he put the bow in the sky as a token of that covenant that he made with the earth. But Nimrod was alienated from God and didn't trust God's promises, I think. In fact, I'm sure of it, or he wouldn't have done what he did. So Nimrod didn't trust God's promise. I, I think what the, I think, you know what I think the tower is all about? I think the tower was man saying, we'll take care of ourselves. We'll build a tower and we'll hide in that tower and climb up that tower and we'll save ourselves from any judgment you might send to us. It's almost like saying, go ahead and send your flood again. We're ready. Noah built his ark, but we'll build a tower. He would keep men all together. He would refuse to scatter and spread out over the earth. He would keep them all together under his power, under his protection, and take them out from under the power of God and the protection of God and alienate them from the promise of God. He would lead men to trust in the brick and slime of man's craftiness to protect them. Instead of trusting in the promise of God. And man, that's something you got to watch out for. If Satan can do it, 
He'll get you to take actions that will be contrary to God's will for your life. And he'll seduce you and trick you into doing it because it looks like the most rational and reasonable thing to do to provide for your needs. And you'll set about to do something that has nothing but pure motives in terms of you're just doing this to pro provide for the family. I'm just doing this to provide for my future. I'm just doing this to, and so on. But, and there's nothing wrong, by the way, with doing that. The Bible teaches that we should be like the ant and, and perceive a foreseeable, inevitable need and in advance make preparations. So don't get me wrong here. But what I'm saying is you go about to meet those needs and you do things that, that you know the Bible says is not right. Or you don't do what the Bible says you should do. And the reason you don't is because you're afraid. Well, if I do what the Bible says I should do, then this is going to happen. Well, if we don't do something, look at those storm clouds. The rains are coming. We can't just sit around and do nothing. Let's build a tower. Instead of trust God's promise. You see? You get it? Instead of somebody coming along, what do you mean building a tower? Like that's going to help you? Good night. God told us he's not going to flood the earth again. Look at the rainbow. Trust the promise. Don't be afraid. Remember that God saw that the imagination of man's heart was evil from his youth. In Genesis 8 verse 21, <coughs> when, when Noah presented that offering, it, it moved God's heart. It softened God's heart as he saw the humble faith of Noah. And God moved with pity and mercy on mankind. He reflected this way. He said, you know, man's uh, heart is, is evil. The imagination, excuse me, of man's heart is evil from his youth. It's just, it's the way he is now. The difference is that in Genesis 6, man's heart was only, the imagination of man's heart was only evil continually. You understand? That was the problem then. Man's heart was only evil continually. I mean, when God looked at the heart of man, he saw nothing there but evil musings. Wow. After the flood, God reasons. This is the condition of man. The imagination of his heart is evil from his youth. But he didn't say only evil or continually. But the evil is there in his imagination. That was the original problem with man. And so God looked at man now, at the Tower of Babel, and here's what he says. He says that if I don't intervene, there will be nothing to restrain man from doing everything in the imagination of his heart. You see, most people take that in a weird way. They think that what God is afraid of is that they're going to build spaceships. And then they're going to be able to reach me, and boy, I better stop them now. And I'm being silly, but in a way, that's the kind of thinking that you run into out there. Oh, no, oh, no, if I don't stop them, they're going to get real smart, and then I'm going to have trouble. That's not what God was concerned about. You've got to read the whole story together. God made it clear what his concern was in Genesis 6. I looked at man's heart and I saw in it only every single imagination I saw in it, is the way I want to put this, because that word imagination needs to get in there. He said, every imagination of his heart was only evil continually. So he wiped him out with a flood. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And now Noah comes off the ark. He presents an offering to God in his softness of his heart now. Pitying man. He reflects on his condition. It's that imagination thing. The devil works in their imagination. And his imagination, the imagination of his heart is evil from his youth. From his youth, evil imaginations pop up. It's the condition of man. And so God in pity gave him this promise, I'll take care of you, I'll be your protector, I'll be your king, I'll watch over you, turn to me, follow me, see? That's what he's saying. But now, Nimrod has led the people against God. 
And God looks at man. He says, you guys are all united. Everybody's uh, speaking the same language and you're all together. It's like, you know how when you have a disease, you want to quarantine people, right? You want to separate the ones with the disease from the ones that don't have the disease so it doesn't spread. Uh huh? Yeah. If you walk into a room full of people who have a disease, what are the chances of you getting it? Pretty good. When you keep people all packed together, they communicate to one another a whole lot. They're all one language. The disease of evil imaginations would spread like wildfire and quickly overtake humanity again. You get it? That's what's going on here. God says, I need to intervene and separate them by different languages so they can't, so they'll be quarantined. I need to establish a quarantine on the earth. And I'll use the division of languages to do it. And so God separated man's languages and they scattered all over the earth and it greatly retarded the increase of evil imaginings. Slowed it down. Gave you a chance to get born so you could get saved. The people of Nimrod went all over the world, however, following his system. And that's the system of setting up a king that ruled over men and led them contrary to God's will. And so began the system of kingdoms. And these kingdoms began to compete with one another for control of the resources of the earth. Because God gave the dominion to Adam, which was dominion or dominance, over all the resources of the earth. But now man is divided. And so man begins to compete on who gets to control the resources of the earth or who gets to hold the dominion. That's exactly what's going on here. So one kingdom would rise up against this kingdom and another against the other, and they would fight in war. And Jesus said that there will be wars and rumors of wars. Kingdom rising up against kingdom. All of that began here. In this story. And so what God does. Is he takes his first step. At giving the kingdom. To whomever he pleases. All of this stuff begins here. It's fascinating to me. But some of you seem a little bit bored. No I'm just kidding. Because you're looking at me and I'm going who? But it's interesting to me. It's just fascinating. All of this stuff, this drama we are dealing with every day of our lives, all of it roots right back to this time in history. And so what God does now is he brings Abraham and he calls Abraham and he says, in thee shall all nations of the earth be blessed. And he furthers, uh, further in his promises to Abraham, listen, he's going to give the land of Canaan to Abraham. Interesting, isn't it? We'll be going back to this a little bit as we proceed in the Chronicles of Abraham in future messages. So I'll, I'll develop that some more later. Let me wrap it up and conclude the message for this morning. Chapters 10 and 11 bridge from the flood to Abraham. Chapter 11, the story of Nimrod, goes from verses 1 to 9. And then at verse 10, through the end of the chapter, it gives you... The generations of Shem, the godly line, the line from which would come our Christ, our Lord. The king God chose for the earth, his own son, would come into the world through the seed of Abraham. God made that decision, that choice, right there at the time when men had pulled the world out from under God formed their own little kingdoms and began to war with one another over the dominion. And God is already saying, no, I'll decide who gets the dominion. It's going to come to my son through this man named Abraham or Abram at, this, at first and later called Abraham. And so we begin the chronicles of Abraham. So to conclude, I said, we're to trust the Lord with all of our heart. Lean not to our own understanding. Don't fall into the trap of trusting princes of this world. 
We must trust the Lord above all men. We must not make the arm of flesh our support. We must depend upon and lean upon the Lord and trust his promises. We must trust the Lord. Just as Nimrod tried to establish the first world order of a kingdom outside of God or out from under God and began to build a tower which represented that rebellious spirit, that fist shaking in God's face saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their courts from us. Those kings of the earth, as Psalm 2 says, that band together and counsel together Say, let's break God's bands off of us. Let's cast away his courts from us. And they, and they rail and rage against the Lord and his anointed. All that started here with Nimrod. They tried to build a tower that would reach unto heaven that would be at least the symbol of their rebellion. That in which they would put their trust that in which they would put their hope and invest their future. They believed that their future would be secured by a great leader representing, and his power represented in this great tower. Well, God interfered, and he stopped them from building their one world government under a human ruler. And men went all over the earth building little kingdoms, all of them trying to erect that tower. And even today, they're trying to do it in the UN. Trying to build Nimrod's tower. In this country, the Nimrods are trying to do everything they can to get us out from under God. To bring us out from under the promises of God. And they've gone so far as to literally blaspheme the symbol of his great promise, the rainbow. You can't even use the rainbow anymore. Without fear, someone will think you're representing yourself flying the flag of the gay rights movement. Well, I'm telling you, they can't have the rainbow. The rainbow belongs to us. It's not theirs. But it makes perfect sense, doesn't it, that the heathen would rage and want to take that rainbow and make it a symbol of rebellion against God. Well, let's stand together in the presence of the Lord as we conclude this morning. We need to trust the King of kings and not the kings of men. We need to put our confidence in the promises of God, not the promises of politicians. Can I get an amen for that one? We need to trust the Lord. Nimrod's great failure. Well, there, was many, there were many things we could list under that heading, but I think fundamentally, Nimrod did not trust the Lord. He didn't trust God. Even though God had put such favor upon his life, he didn't trust God. Don't make that mistake. Even in small ways, don't make that mistake. And if God has laid a chastening hand upon you or in your family, and he may well have, he does it because he loves you. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. You know why he rebuked Ham? Because he loved him. Ham made the wrong response. He responded with bitterness and resentment and alienated himself from his brothers and his father. And that went passed down to generations and generations and generations. Don't make that mistake. Trust the Lord.